This is um, exponents. And mostly exponential laws. You too? I don't know. It's in there somewhere. I don't need to use this book. I just kind of let you use it. Uh, where to start? Okay. If I have something like 3 squared, what does it mean? 3 times. 3 times 3. If I have something 3 to the 7th, what does it mean? 3 times 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 3. It starts getting long-winded. If I have 3 to the 21st, now writing it down is getting redundant. So is there a way of phrasing it so that we can all understand exactly what it means? Well. It's 3 times 3 times 3, 21 times. But then is it the group of 3s 21 times? So that would be 63 of them. Or is it just 21 3s multiplied together? What do you think? That language sucks, doesn't it? It's very confusing. <laughs> so I need a language that is very, very clear, very concise. So if I go over here and I say 6 is equal to 2 times 3, what do you call the 2 and the 3 of 6? They're factors. So I can come over here and say, well, this is 2 factors of 3. This is 7 factors of 3. This would be 21 factors of 3. 21 factors of 3. That's a lot of 3s. The answer is outrageously huge, so we're not going to worry about what it is. What if I had 3 to the 17 times 3 to the 21st? Well, this is 17 factors of 3, a bunch of them. This one would be 21 factors of 3, another bunch of them. And I'm putting them um, together. What do I do with the exponents then? You add them, because that would give you that many factors of 3. So this would be 3 to the 38. So that language actually helps us solve a few of these little problems. So laws, there's a bunch of them. There is no order to these laws. It is not like the order of operations where you have to do parentheses, exponents, and so forth and so on. You can choose any one of these to work at any one time as long as they're applicable. There are easier ways and harder ways, of course, and I always lean towards keeping things really simple. Otherwise, it gets confusing. Law number one is actually this one, which is a to the m times a to the n is equal to. By the way, what is a? What's it called? A base. And then the n and the n are the exponents. One thing to notice here is what's not happening to the base? It's not changing at all. It stays exactly the same. So when you're working with numbers and exponents, exponents come first. You have to do something with them. The bases generally do not change ever. So this becomes a to the m plus n. Just add the exponents. That's the easy one. Law number two, before I get into it, if I have three, uh, yeah, no, three to the fifth over three to the second. This is three times three times three times three times three over three times three. Five factors of three over two factors of three. What happens? I know, but what happens here? I want you to say the word. What happens to these three? Cancel. Oh. Cancel. What property is cancel? Inverse and inverse. And inverse first, because that becomes one, and then one times whatever becomes the identity. Remember, if you say the word cancel, it's inverse identity. So we can cancel those two threes, and we can cancel these two threes. Don't forget to leave behind a one, because if everything in the top disappears, you're left with a one. Oh, a zero. A one. So what's left is one, two, three factors of three. Three factors of three, which is better known as three cubed. So what happens when we do this canceling? Well, we're removing two factors away from the five. What operation is removing? Subtraction. So if I have a to the m divided by a to the n, this is a to the m minus n. 
Addition doesn't cause us any problems. Subtraction causes us uh, a few problems. Problem number one. If you have a cubed over a cubed, and we use law number two, that becomes a to the zero. But why? Yeah, that's what you were taught, but why? <laughs> the idea is right here. What's 5 divided by 5? 6 divided by 6? A cubed divided by A cubed? 1. The reason that A to the 0 is equal to 1 is because you're dividing the same thing by the same thing, and that just becomes 1. It inverses out. So this has a little subrule. A to the raised to the 0 power is equal to 1. Anything raised to the zero power is equal to one. What's the common mistake? A to the zero equals zero. <sighs> that zero keeps showing up. You don't want zero. Why? Because zero times anything is zero and things get really boring. All right, the other problem is if we switch things around, a to squared over a to the fifth. When you do your um, rule, number two, you get a to the negative 3. Ooh, that's weird. So if we expand it, 2 a's in the top, 5 a's in the bottom, we do our inverse identity twice, what's left in the top? 1. What's left in the bottom? a squared. a squared. Who said that? I did a cubed. Now, since both of these were done mathematically correct, the two answers must be exactly the same. They have to. So the second law that goes with subtraction is a raised to any negative power is the same thing as 1 over a to the positive power. In other words, if you have a negative exponent, it's on the wrong side of the fraction. It's on the wrong side of the fraction. If you have a negative exponent in the top, bring the base to the bottom, make it a positive exponent. If you have a negative exponent in the bottom, bring it to the top, the base, just the base and the exponent. So the exponent becomes positive. All right. Rule number three. This is the one you memorize. And there's a reason you memorize this one. It loses your confusion with the first one. A lot of people get one and three confused. But if you memorize three, it clears up number one. Um, I'll just write it. A to the m raised to the n. In other words, a power raised to a power. Well, this is n factors of a to the m. That's how you would read it. It's n factors of a to the m. But a to the m is m factors of a. So this becomes n factors of m factors of a. So what operation do you think you use with the word of? Multiplication. Multiplication. If you have a hundred of dozen eggs, then it would be a hundred times twelve would give you a hundred. So this becomes a to the mn. So power to a power, multiply. That's the one you want to memorize. That's the only one that kept my head straight when I was learning this stuff, to understand which one do you add and which one do you multiply. If you know which one to multiply, the other one must be add. All right. Rule number four. This doesn't follow the book exactly. These are just rules, and again, there is no order to them. If you want to do rule number one first or rule number three first, that's fine. Uh, well, there's a little bit of order as you get into them, but we'll show you. Um, this one. A, B raised to the n power, or A over B raised to the n power. Remember I told you earlier that multiplication and division are exactly the same operation? Uh, this kind of proves that you do exactly the same thing. This is m factors of ab. So how many a's are there? m of them. How many b's are there? m of them. So this just becomes a raised to the m, b raised to the m. And similarly, if you have a over b raised to the m, you're going to have how many m's of, or a's in the top? m of them. And how many b's in the bottom? M of them. So it's exactly the same. Problem. A lot of people see this and they're thinking distributive property. Is this the distributive property? Mm -hmm. 
Really? What does a distributed property have to have? When you look at the distributed property, it has to have what sign? Give me an example of the distributed property. Um, two parentheses. Two parentheses. A plus B. A plus B. Okay. So what does the distributed property have to have? A plus or a minus. minus. Do you see a plus or a minus over here? This is not the distributed property. Not even close. It's just saying that you have the same number of A's as you have B's. That's all it's saying. Now, if we put together 3 and 4, these two laws into one fell swoop, we get, uh, well, let's just call it 5 and be done with it. A to the M, B to the N, raised to the power of P. So what happens is like a two-step process. You're going to say that there are P factors of this one and P factors of that one. Split them apart. But then power to a power says you have to multiply them. So this becomes A to the MP, B to the NP. And again, it is not the distributive property because there is no plus and there is no minus. So don't even think of it that way. It's just the way things work. Now, my favorite law of all, it really isn't a law. It's just a, a accumulation of a few things. It's actually uh, the fraction part raised to the M here and the negative exponent from over here. But this one comes in very handy. A over B raised to a negative 1. On your calculators, there's this little button called X to the negative 1. And it does exactly the same thing as what I'm going to show you here. X to the negative 1 on your calculator is when you're in like a science class and you do a calculation and you come up with an answer. But you need to take that answer and divide it into another number. What do you have to do? Well, most people write the number down, type the other number into your calculator, and then divide and then take the number that you wrote down and put it in. What this allows you to do is to take the answer that's in your calculator, divide it by what you really want to do the other way, hit that button, and it puts it in. And fixes your division. So if you divide by the wrong number, it makes sure you divide by the right number. So the only thing that this does is it flips the fraction. So instead of A divided by B, now you have B divided by A. So guess what the name of this function is? Reciprocal. It literally is reciprocal. So X to the negative 1 is called the reciprocal button. Reciprocal button. That comes in handy for simplifying a lot of uh, exponential expressions. For example, negative 3a squared b to the negative 4 times 4a to the negative 5b squared. Just making it up as I go. Uh. What do you do first? You could put the negative exponents to the bottom. You can. Like I said, there is no order to this. Uh, but I'm not going to do that first. You can. It's not going to hurt anything. Common. Group them together. What property do you use when you group them? Associate is part of it, but what's the first thing you need to do? Get them next to each other. So if I need to get the 4 next to this negative 3, what property is that? Or does it just magically happen? What's that? It tells us that magic and math. What property allows you to switch the orders of numbers? Commutative. So we'd be flipping things around until the 4 and the negative 3 were next to each other. Now this step that I'm going to write is usually what's done in your head. But I like showing it because some people don't see it the right way. I've seen people do distributive property on this thing. What's missing? A plus or a minus. This is all multiplication. So you get 3 times 4. And then if you group the other ones, which is a squared and a to the negative fifth, uh, again, commutative property. And then b to the negative fourth and b squared. If you group them, at least mentally in your head, this becomes actually three separate problems. So you don't think of it as one huge problem, it's just three little pieces that you need to put together. 
So what's negative 3 times 4? Negative 12. A squared times A to the negative 5? A to the negative 3, add the exponents. Um, B to the negative 4, B squared. B to the negative 2nd. Now, if you chose to get rid of the negative exponents in the beginning, they would have been in the bottom and then things, you yeah, know, they would have worked out okay. But now that we have these negative exponents, where do they go? To the bottom. What about the negative 12? It's a number. He does not behave like a exponent. Don't mix up numbers and exponents. That will really kill you. So once you already decided, ooh, bad fraction bar. Once you've already decided to put something in the bottom, the first thing you write is a fraction bar. So you have a top and a bottom. So then you have a cubed b squared in the bottom and negative 12 in the top. Ta -da. This is easy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So far. Do you think that'll be on the test? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> Not that easy. Come on. You should be able to do that one in your sleep. So what type do I put on a test? Uh, horrid ones. Uh, let's just build it up as we go, though. What if we have negative 2a cubed b squared times 4a uh, negative 5b raised to the negative 3? Or should I make that positive 3? Now let's really mess it up. Negative 3. Now things get a little weirder. Can you multiply the negative 2 and the 4? No. Why? You need to do exponents first. So order of operations still comes into play here. Exponents have to happen before multiplication, um, division, subtraction, and addition. So how do I take care of this negative 3? Ooh, that gets kind of messy. I need to take this whole thing and put it in the bottom. That gets very weird looking eventually. So that's probably not the best thing to do. My suggestion to you is this. If you have a power on the outside, simplify the inside as much as you can. This is where I would take that a to the negative 5 and bring it to the bottom, but keep it as two separate terms. So leave the first one alone, and I would highly suggest just rewriting this as 4b over a to the fifth, especially if it's a negative exponent, because what do negative exponents do to a fraction? They flip it. They reciprocate it. So if you have a fraction to reciprocate, it makes things a lot easier than rather than taking the whole thing to the bottom. Okay. Now what can I do? Well, take care of the negative part. Remember, this is like negative 1 times 3. So the negative part says take this fraction and flip it. So if I flip it, what goes up top? A to the fifth. And the bottom is going to go or B. Whatever's there, leave it alone. When you do this flip, don't be changing any signs on the inside. Just flip what's there and leave it alone. What does the negative 3 become? Positive 3. You don't ever want to rush one of these problems because there's a lot of little subtleties in them. All right, still can't touch that first one. So negative 2a cubed b squared times. Now we have this uh, inside simplified as much as we can. A to the fifth cubed? Is it 15 or 8? Power to a power? Oh, Multiply. So this is A to the 15. 4 cubed? Is that a calculator? Anyone? Ten. No. That's power to a power. This is not, that's a number. 4 times 4 times 4. 54. I don't want to memorize a few cubes. 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, 4 cubed is 64, 5 cubed is 125. Um, B to the third. Technically, B to the first to the third, and then when you multiply, you put B to the third. Whew, almost done. Now what can I do? My suggestion? Group. Number to number, A to A, B to B. Create three separate problems out of this, and then take your three answers and put them together. So here you have a negative 2, and here you have a 64. So how am I going to write it? Negative 2 over 64. Don't worry about simplifying it right now. Of course, this is a mental thing. All right, and then the a's. Well, you're going to have a cubed from the left and 
A to the 15th from the right, and then the Bs. Is it B squared times B cubed? No, it's going to be underneath. It's going to be underneath it, so it's B squared over, over B cubed. If it's in the bottom, you have to leave it in the bottom. If it's in the top, you have to leave it in the top. If you get confused with that, this whole thing is over 1. What property allows you to do that? You are you. Identity. It's an identity. Dividing by 1 is the same thing as multiplying by 1, and 1 is the identity. Multiplicative. All right, and then separately, what's negative 2 over 64? 32. Exactly 32. One over. Negative 1 over 32. So this is negative 1 32nd. A cubed times A to the 15th. A to the 18th. And B squared over B cubed. 1 over B is the, probably the best way to write it. Or B to the negative 1, and you can fix the um, you can fix it later. All right, and then the last thing is, whatever's in the top stays in the top. Whatever's in the bottom stays in the bottom. So this becomes negative a to the 18th over 32b. And there's your answer. Well, I'm showing every single little baby step. There are shortcuts. No, that's just it's about to break down. Yes, and, that, and that's why you have to be focused on all the laws. Power to a power multiply, base times base add, base over base subtract. Uh, anything with a negative exponent goes on the bottom and or top, opposite side of the fraction. How about something like this? No, it is not. <laughs> Good try, though. Hmm. It's not a Z, it's a two. My Z's have a little wine. Negative seven x squared y to the negative three all over fourteen x to the fifth y to the negative second z to the zero, all raised to the negative two. Hopefully, I have enough room over there. I think. Okay, what would you want to do first? On the outside, you can, you can. Um, but again, like I said over here, probably the best step that you can do is. Try to simplify the inside first, and then worry about the outside. So is there anything on the inside that I can do? I, I, I you could flip the whole thing, but then you can be simplifying the inside second, so it doesn't really matter. This becomes negative 1 over 2. Why x to the third in the bottom? You're not following a law. You're doing a shortcut, girl. That's fine. That's fine. You, you notice that if you, um, it's negative 3. And then you'd shift it to the bottom. The trick is, if this is smaller, you want to shift it down. Make that the one negative, and then it keeps the answer positive. But that's a trick. I'll go with it. So this is negative 1 over 2, you said, right? If you bring the x down, that becomes x to the 5th times x to the negative 2, better known as x to the 3rd. What about the y's? I knew that would get some people. This is negative 3 minus negative 2, which is y to the negative 1 in the top, so I want to shift it to the bottom, so that just becomes y. z to the 0? 1. Don't write anything unless it's the only thing to write. And then this whole thing is being raised to the negative 2. When you're dealing with two negatives, I always suggest that you write it off to the side, the calculation, because your brain will want to do weird things like five. Okay, now what should I do? Flip it. 
flip it. Now, if I flip it, there's going to be a 1 in the bottom, so I really don't want to write it. So the only thing I have to write is a negative. So this becomes negative 2 x cubed y raised to the second power. But if you want, you can write it as 2x cubed y all over negative 1. You'll eventually get the right answer. Negative 2 squared is positive 4. x cubed squared, x to the 6. y squared, and there's your answer. So these things are not hard. You just have to go very, very cautiously through them and make sure you've got those laws off to the side to make sure you're following one of them. I still don't understand that about the, the five, remember I said five, what, what did you do? When you have a base over base here, yeah. what property do you do with the exponents? You subtract. You subtract them. So it's a negative three on the top, mm -hmm. negative two in the bottom, and you're going to subtract them. And a negative negative is a positive. So it becomes negative one. So that would be y to the negative one in the top up here. Uh -huh. But y to the negative one is the same thing as okay. y in the bottom. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, I need you to break it down. Yeah. So when it, like the z computer made, it disappears. So it's a zero exponent. Oh, don't, please don't oh, use okay, magic in math. Things okay. don't disappear. <laughs> z to the zero is equal to? Zero. One. One, and one times anything is the identity. So okay. Okay. like I said, it goes away only if there's other stuff there. If it's the only thing there, then you have to write one. If that makes any sense. I've had on my test before. Oh, wait. Yeah. I've had on my test before a bunch of junk over a bunch of junk, and then out here raised to the zero. What's the answer to that? One. I had people simplifying the inside, getting it all straightened out, and then they went. So um, if it's raised to the zero power, the answer is automatically one, no matter what. <sighs> Trick questions. Trick question number one. Um, two raised to the x plus one times two raised to the x minus one. Oh, you tell me. What's the answer? I have taught you everything you need to know to do this problem. The answer is not one. What's it gotta be? Two <laughs> times four x plus one. Okay, you just made this easy problem <laughs> extremely hard. Follow a law of exponents. But oh, you're adding you're adding x plus one plus x minus one, right? Uh-huh. Okay. And you okay. get So, uh, is it 2x? Is, um, is it 4 to the 2x? No. <laughs> I mean, why would it be 4 to the 2x? Because it's, you keep the base. It's it, 2. If you're multiplying two numbers together, where's 1? 8 to the 3rd, 8 to the 15th. What do you do with the exponents? You add them. But did the a change? No, the base never changes. So the base here has to be 2. Without a doubt, this is 2 raised to some power. Now, how do you figure out the power? You take the two exponents and you add them. Oh. Oh. So it's, it's x. <laughs> same thing, same thing. So x plus 1 plus x minus 1 is 2x. So this is 2 to the 2x. I don't know what it is with changing the way things look. People think they have to be done differently. If there is a law, you have to follow the law. This is equal to 2 to the x plus 1 plus x minus 1. I want to think of it that way. When you have base times base, you add the exponents. The exponents here happen to be x plus 1 and x minus 1. And when you add them, the 1s go away. They cancel. Inverse identity. And the x plus x is 2x. But what property is x plus x equal 2x? What? Distributive. Ah, distributive. Yes, you need to know those. Okay, how about um, five divided or five raised to the two x plus three divided by five raised to the x minus four? 
Question number one. Do the fives cancel? No. Bases don't change. So the first thing you're going to write down is five. That's your base. It's just a symbol. What do I do with the exponents? Subtract, Subtract them. So this becomes 2x plus 3 minus x minus 4. Now if you just, you know, properties. There's a 1 here. Why is there a 1 there? Identity. And what do I have to do with this negative 1? Distribute it. What's in front of this parentheses over here? A 1. What do I have to do with it? Distribute. When you just drop the parentheses in that case, you're technically multiplying by that 1. So this becomes 5 raised to the 2x plus 3 minus x plus 4, because you're distributing that negative 1 across those parentheses. And then this becomes 5 raised to the x plus 3. Isn't that cool? If there is a law, you need to follow it. You cannot make up your own little rules, shortcuts, or whatnot. You have to follow laws. Shortcuts are great. How many of you have um, gone on long trips and taken a shortcut and gotten lost? <laughs> I've done it many times, and even if I have a map, I'm still lost. So when you do a shortcut in math, you better make sure it works all the time, not just in a certain case. It has to work all the time. When in doubt, always go back to the laws. Always follow some kind of rule. Ah. <sighs>